My name's Freeland Dunker, and I've been a veterinarian for 25 years now. I um, started out, I was a graduate from UC Davis in 82, and I started out in private practice. Um, my main interest at that point was large animal. I was an equine surgeon for a period of time and mixed animal practice. I got interested in the zoo field, and I've been at the San Francisco Zoo for the past 16 years and at the Steinhardt Aquarium as their staff veterinarian for the last 13 years. So both those facilities give me a wide range of animal diversity from fish and vertebrates to, to dolphins to elephants, rhinos, you name it. I've been fortunate enough to have the opportunity to work on all those different types of animals. So anyway, we'll get started here. Um, Basically, the outline of the presentation is I'm going to spend a little bit of time, and again, may, hopefully, maybe part, at least half of it, I think, on just the careers of veterinary medicine, you know, what it takes to get into veterinary school, um, the, the costs of, of what veterinary education is now, um, various opportunities. So we have, you know, what is a veterinarian, the education needed to be a veterinarian, we'll talk about areas of veterinary medicine, which... I, one of the things I think is so great about uh, veterinary medicine is you, the opportunities are limitless having that degree. You can do so many different things. Um, also the earnings of a veterinarian, which may not be the best, but again, focus on the great opportunity. Um, future outlook as veterinarian as a, as a career. And then at the end, I have a couple cases of, um, zoo at the zoo and to go over and talk about a little bit. So first of all, what is a veterinarian? Um, basically, veterinarians diagnose and control animal diseases, um, treat sick and injured animals, prevent the transmission of zoonotic diseases. Um, a zoonotic disease is a disease that is transmitted from animals to man. Um, also, advise owners on proper care of pets, working animals, livestock, things that you may not be aware of as well as we ensure a safe food supply by um, maintaining the health of food animals, inspecting meat and poultry products to make sure that no diseases that can be transmitted to humans occur. Yes. <laughs> that is part, um, and we get into the public health aspect of being a veterinarian. If an animal caused that, then we would be involved. If it was a human that caused it, then it may be the other part of public health. But it, and also too, what's really neat, which I'm very proud of, is the veterinarian has a unique education that allows both, um, that allows us to benefit both animals and human health. That we have the education that allows us to take care of the animals of, or various species of animals. Our education also allows us to be involved in environmental protection, food safety, and public health. Okay, education, high school, um, strong science, math, biology program. Um, it's good, veterinary medicine is a competitive field. Um, undergraduate, pre-veterinary medicine course, um, if any of you are interested or involved in a pre-vet classes, you know, it's heavy on the sciences, heavy in the, um, in the mathematics and also biology, embryology, all those type of sciences. At that time when I started um, getting in, when I got, tried to get into veterinary school, algebra was as high as the math that we needed, or geometry I think was as high as the math that we needed. Now it's calculus, um, which I never had an opportunity to take. Um, also, physics is another, another important aspect of it. Um, you, pr you complete your pre-vet requirements, it usually takes about three to four years. Um, you then, that allows you then to apply to veterinary school, that you also have to take the GRE exam, and then also an application to the school of, of your choice. The average acceptance rate for veterinary school is about 33% at this time. Um, there are 27 accredited veterinary colleges in the United States, um, um, four Canadian and some other foreign countries. Actually, 
since this was done, we actually have 28. There's a new school that opened up in Southern California that has started a couple years ago. Educational depth, this debt. This is the tough part about being a veterinarian or going into veterinary school. Um, this is of the statistics of 2004, which at that time in 2004, um, tuition or registration was $11,000 a quarter, um, or excuse me, a year. Um, then plus the other amenities, um, books, housing, food, travel, brought it up to about 25,000. So basically to get through veterinary school costs you $100,000. Um, so at that time, the mean debt for vet graduates at that time was $81,000. Now, 2006, 2007, tuition registration has doubled to 22,000 um, with the additional costs of living, books, housing, will bring it up to 40,000. So now it's $160,000 to get through veterinary school. As opposed to when I graduated, it was 40,000 for the whole thing. For four years, it was a 10,000 a year to get through. We were also at that point, um, which was interesting too, to back up is apply to veterinary schools. Um, when I was applying to veterinary school, we could only apply to the school in our state. Um, we did not have an option to apply out of state. If I wasn't a resident of California, if I, whatever school I wanted to apply to, I had to have a year residency in that state. Um, now, um, veterinary schools, are you can apply cross board and you have many more options. We were more state funded at that time. The California state, you know, they helped supplement our, our, um, our schoolings with the notice that they would, we would hopefully stay in California and then benefit California's agricultural, um, agricultural companies or agricultural part. So anyway, that is one of the difficult things in veterinary medicine is the cost of schooling is expensive. Um, areas of veterinary medicine are vast, and that's what I like so much about this profession, is we have private or corporate clinical practice, which is the corporate is now, you know, before we were, veterinarians were, um, you know, run their own business, small businesses. Now there's more corporate, pet smart, you know, various other pet care, you know, have various hospitals that are run by a corporation. So that's why that's now in there. Um, teaching and research, regulatory medicine, public health, military service, and then others. Um, private or corporate practice. Um, of the veterinarians, which there are, which I'll back up a little bit, is there are about 82,000 veterinarians in the United States, practicing veterinarians. Um, so about 67% or 70% of those 82,000 are in private or um, corporate clinical practice. Um, and of these, many of them treat only pets in the small animal practice. About of the 70% of the total, this 70, there's 70% of this 70% are in small animal practice. Um, veterinarians involved in a mixed animal practice, which is pets, horses, and livestock, is about, is about um, 30, 20%. And then 10% are veterinarians that their practice is limited to farm. So food animal is a need. Food animal um, medicine, veterinarians participating in food animal medicine is something that's needed. Um, majority of the people now that are graduating from veterinary school are small animal practitioners. Um, then comes the mixed animals, more of the pet related as opposed to the food industry. Okay, then, of, then about of 20% of the total is teaching and research. Okay, this is the um, um, teachers that instruct veterinary students and other medical professionals. These are the teachers at the veterinary schools. Um, also college or university f faculty members that teach as well. There's veterinarians at, um, down to the junior college level as well as um, university level that teach anatomy, physiology, various other um, entities of the sciences as well. Um, they also, important thing too is um, faculty members conduct research, um, develop continuing educational programs, 
Also, veterinarians play an important role in pharmaceutical and biomedical research firms. Um, they develop, test, supervise the production of drugs and biological products. Um, so there's various, like, um, various um, pharmacological companies hire veterinarians to manage and to um, maintain their animal collection for research purposes, as well as veterinarians that to maintain their, their wealth, their well-being during research processes. Also employed, um, they're in management of um, technical sales services. There's veterinarians for various medical instruments, um, things for both the veterinary field as well as the human field that veterinarians are behind the scenes researching to allow it to come to fruition for the human field. Also, there's veterinarians for um, Perina. The Perina dog or pet food company have um, veterinarians on staff to make sure that the right type of um, elements are going into their food. So that's 20%. Then we start to drop down to 5%. Um, this is regulatory medicine. Um, working with the U.S. Department of Agriculture, um, basically importance in the control elimination of certain diseases and to protect the public from animal diseases that can affect people. So Department of Agriculture, veterinarians are integral in um, if there's disease outbreaks of, of let's say farm animals, whether it be brucellosis, whether it be tuberculosis, um, various diseases, um, state veterinarians are there to try to control it or eradicate it. Also, there is also the regulatory agencies for quarantine. Any animals, shipment of animals, poultry, you know, there's a big factor right now with avian influenza, all that, you know, as far as veterinarians making sure that disease hopefully does not um, enter our, our borders. Um, so they inspect animals brought into the U.S. for quarantine. They also, um, USDA veterinarians also inspect facilities, research facilities, as well as um, the zoo for to make sure that we are taking care of our animals under the Animal Welfare Act. So they are our, I guess you could say, watchdogs. Then there's public health. Um, these are public health veterinarians that are employed by the city, county, or state federal agencies. Um, majority of your Continue education to be a public health veterinarian is to move on to epidemiology, um, to determine, um, investigate animal and human disease outbreaks. Um, also, study and evaluate the effects of various biological contaminants on people and animals. Um, you look at that picture and you go, that's a beaver, okay? Why did I put that up there? Um, I put that up there because, I don't know if you've heard of beaver fever? Giardia. Giardia is a parasite that they carry asymptomatically. They shed in the streams and water systems. When you're up hiking, you pick that up by drinking water if you don't boil it properly and get diarrhea, abdominal cramps, various other amenities. So that's why I threw him up there. <laughs> I always thought that was a cool uh, military service. Excuse me, that was um, public health is about 2%. Uh, military service is about, excuse me, public health about 5%. Then we start drop down a bit more to military service, which is about 2%. Um, serving in the U.S. Army, there's two branches that, that employ uh, veterinarians. One is the U.S. Army and the other is the U.S. Air Force. Um, the U.S. Army Veterinary Corps Corps is for food safety. Um, if you ever were in the military or on a military base, you'd always see if they see cans of food in the in the commissary, it'll say it's, it, you know approved by a veterinarian. You know, so all every every food item that that comes through has a label on it approved by veterinarian. You know, to make sure that that food is safe for human consumption. And so, also too, like we talked about biomedical research, um, we also take care of the um, animals that are government owned. The um, dolphins, the, the dogs, various other elements of animals that are used for military service. 
Um, U.S. Air Force um, is a little more involved in the management of communicable infectious diseases and insect-borne diseases. Um, they also are again at the forefront of bioterrorism. Um, they're involved in research programs as well. So there's, this is another entity. It's interesting that there is a lot of, not a lot of, but there's a presence of the military at veterinary schools at this point because they will defer or they will pick up the tab for that 160,000 if you go into the service after you graduate and spend a certain period of time with them. And in talking with a number of um, senior veterinary students who rotate through the zoo, there's a lot of people that are taking that route to allow them um, the ability to get their debts paid and then provide service in the military. So we get into other areas of veterinary medicine. There's zoo practice. This is a 2% right here of the total. And you know, I'm kind of very fortunate to be more in a, in a much smaller compressed um, area of, of veterinary medicine, zoo practice, aquatic animal medicine, space medicine, wildlife management, nonprofit shelters, racetracks. So you can see here that um, the degree of of diversity that you have, I mean, it, it's amazing to be a veterinarian of all the things that you're capable of doing. Um, then comes the earnings as a veterinarian. So you keep focusing on all these wonderful things you're doing, you know, as a veterinarian. Um, and so anyway, the factors, and also too, I'll back up too, is I have a lot of, you know, veterinary medicine, a good recommendation for you guys is when you get into school, if you have an interest in veterinary medicine, don't limit yourself. Think that you're going to have the opportunity to do anything and anything and everything. Don't limit yourself to one species or don't go in and go, all I want to be is a dog vet. You know, all I want to do is research. You know, all those things are something that you do not know what you're going to get into. I had no idea I'd be a zoo veterinarian you know, if I was getting into veterinary school. All I wanted to be was a private practice, large animal vet. That's what I wanted to do. And then all of a sudden I'm doing this now. I have a classmate that all he wanted to be was a dairy practitioner. Now he's board certified and has a five man practice, birds only. That's <laughs> all he does. And, and has, has written many papers and many book chapters and things. And all he does is birds now. The connection he had when I was roommates with him is he used to stuff them. <laughs> is he was a taxidermy, his hobby was taxidermy. And so we had ducks and pheasants and all sorts of stuff all over the house that he would stuff. And that, but again, you, that was his connection at that point. But you never know. And all of a sudden, that's what he does and that's all he does. So you just never know and again, Again, to go through that is you, as a veterinarian, you have the ability to morph into any situation if you're willing, as well as any area. Um, injuries can preclude you from various things. Lar I have a lot of friends, large animal vets, who've been injured, um, bad backs, broken this or that, or disfigurement, things like that, that can happen from getting kicked or stepped on. Um, and therefore, they can't be a large animal vet anymore, but they have opportunities to be a small animal vet. They have opportunities to go into teaching, to go into research. If they were to move from one area to another for, for um, family reasons, um, there's always a job available as a veterinarian if you're willing to allow yourself to, to, open, to be open to all those possibilities. Um, Could you tell us how, how you got to do the zoo? The zoo? Yeah, that, how I got to do the zoo was, um, it actually was an interesting story, is when I was in the equine surgical practice, it was down in San Diego, there were four of us in that practice. The, our boss, um, Dan, was the consulting veterinarian for the Wild Animal Park in the San Diego Zoo. And so he would go and do all their surgeries on all their hoofstock, their elephants, their rhinos, giraffes, you know, zebras, anything that had hooves. Um, he did the work on. We would cover his calls while he would spend the day at the zoo. Occasionally, we would, if we could work our calls out, we could go help 
And that got me interested in, in pursuing veterinary medicine in zoos. And so I then left there and kind of floated around in a mixed animal practice for a while. And, but I always kind of had that bug about wanting to be a potential to be a zoo veterinarian. And so I had to then, I was out of school, I think that was about seven years or so. So I went back um, to make myself marketable in a more specific field. I had to do an internship or residency at a zoo to give me the marketability to then uh, move on to, um, to zoo practice. And then once I finished that, I had not had a zoo job, but I set myself up as a zoo relief veterinarian. So then I went in zoos that I spent a month at the Dallas Zoo. I spent time at the Fresno Zoo. I just worked at various zoos when veterinarians needed help. San Francisco Zoo was one of the zoos that I was doing relief work at. And then that evolved from you know, part-time to full-time, and, and here I am still. So anyway, we'll get into earnings. Earnings. Okay, the, this is a, a bit, you know, we, I think the data that we have right now, I think went up to 2004. Um, basically, um, about 80, 82, 85,000 a year is what, is what a veterinarian makes. That's the salary of a veterinarian. A new grad may make about 50,000, okay? Um, when you look at all the various costs, industry, i.e. the people that work for Zaki Farms, Oscar Mayer, all those things that, that big corporate, they're the ones who make the bucks. Also the ones that anti, um, the, the drug, and, yeah, the drug companies, all that, they're the ones who make the money. Then comes your um, college and university do pretty well as well, but your industries at the top, your mixed animal are actually in a bit lower, that's not listed on there, is your food animal practitioner. Again, that's your you know, 10%. You know, those are the people that really don't make the money, um, but they're also great, giving a great benefit to, the, to agriculture. Um, the other, which is me, is about that. Again, when you're dealing with the nonprofits, that type of stuff, you just don't make the bucks like, like others do in more of the industry. Um, so that is a, um, a function of how much, how much they make. Pardon? Oh yeah, those are baby hedgehogs. I'm sorry, yeah. I, they had nothing to do with the salaries, but I thought they were I, just a cool picture. Yeah, they come out. Yeah, that is actually, we had, um, those aren't ours, but we had a litter of them. They look like little erasers with these little pricks on them. There you go. There you go. I, I'll, I'll remember that next time. That'll be a good one. Okay, future outlook. Okay, I think it's good. Um, I think that, you know, as far as pet practice is always going to increase with the baby boomers, um, rising incomes, education, people are, pets have become a major factor in a human's experience. Um, also, people are willing to pay for their veterinary care a lot more than they used to. Um, employment outlook is especially good for vets with specialty training. Um, just like in the human field, veterinarians have moved into cardiology, radiology, dermatology, um, surgeons, um, neurology. So there's, at this point, a lot of times the, if you're in a, a, city, a, a city area, a kind of a general practitioner has all these specialists at their fingertips to be able to, um, to be able to call upon. And the people are willing to pay for that specialty training. But again, we also need veterinarians in environmental, public health, aquaculture, and food animal practice. We still, those are areas that we're lacking at this time. Um, another neat thing is the veterinary medical profession is growing approximately 3% per year. Um, they did a 10-year study of um, from 2000 to 2010, the veterinary profession will grow um, about 32, 33%, as opposed to pharmacists, which is 24%, MDs, which is 18%, and 
and dentists about 6%. So of those type of professions, the veterinary profession, because of all these things, and now with the spur, unfortunately, of bioterrorism and those type of things that may be with us for a long time, veterinarians are needed in those areas as well. Um, so what's the overall summary of a veterinarian is great opportunities. There's always something for a veterinarian to do. Um, and also a, a stable income. Not a good income, but a stable income to where you can find a job anywhere. Um, it's a good income for, a, it's a good earnings for a two income family. Um, also too, they did a study, which I think is pretty cool, is of the top 10 professionals, um, who do you trust? Um, both trust and ethics, veterinarians are third of those top 10 with um, nurses, nurses being number one, pharmacists number two, then veterinarians, then MDs are number four, I think dentists are seven or eight. Lawyers were nine. <laughs> College professors were seven. <laughs> High school teachers were five. Um, and then police were 10. Of, of, of the top 10. Of the top 10. But I think that's pretty neat. I think that has a lot to say for our profession. And I hope that that will always be that way or even be higher. But I, I think that's pretty neat to be in the top three of that type of profession. Okay, so then we got some time. Zoo medicine. So that is, anybody have any, well, we'll, we'll do it after we're all done, um, if we have some time. But now we'll do zoo medicine. This is, um, this is the field that I've chosen and have enjoyed tremendously. Um, I think that, first of all, zoo medicine gives me quite the vast opportunities. It's the opportunities of both just treating the animals medically as well as dealing with zoonotic issues, public health. I deal with public health veterinarians and I take care of um, the, I'm also in charge of both the animal health as well as the human keeper health. I'm the guardian for all the zoonotic diseases, any diseases that can be transmitted from those animals to our keeper staff I'm in charge of. I, have made a preventive health program for our animals as far as vaccinating annual physicals. I have a preventive health program for our keeper staff too, working with our health services to with our occupational health people to develop a program that will keep as far as physicals, monitoring titers of various diseases they may be exposed to, um, restricting if a uh, uh, keeper is to become pregnant, what areas they can work in, what they can't to try to protect them, them as well. So I get an involvement in public health, I get an involvement in taking care of animals, I get involvement in USDA, their regulations in complying to the Animal Welfare Act. Welfare Act. So I have a, quite a wide range that's opened up to me, which I think is great. So what we're gonna talk about a little bit is using domestic animals as models, um, because a lot of people will go, someone brings in a, uh, like a lot of times I'll talk with a specialist and I go, I got a lion that is blah, blah, blah. And they go, oh my God, I can't treat that. You know, it's a lion. And I go, well, it's just a big cat. You know, it's, it's you look at, you look at all that. Pardon? They exactly are. And so what we'll do is we'll start with models, dogs. Okay, all these are dogs. Pardon? Bears are dogs. Sea lion's a big dog. And that's what originally when I started, I also worked a number of years at the Marine Mammal Center. Um, and I remember when the veterinarian was gonna leave for two weeks, she said, Freeland, can you cover? And I said, sure. I said, I don't know really much about sea lions or seals, but you know, I'll, I'll, she goes, don't worry about it. They're just like big dogs. And the techs do most of the work anyway. So, um, and that's what they are, yeah. No, koalas are unique. They're marsupials. But what's interesting, and I will, they're like a horse. <laughs> koala's a horse, yet a kangaroo's like a cow. And we'll go through that. <laughs> yeah, sure. And so anyway, basically what I do is when I look in my library, my library is 
full of domestic animal books, medicine. My, the, veteran, the specific, my book on wolf medicine is like this. And all it is is notes and articles that people may have written. But what I do is my drug dosages, all that, I treat like a dog. So all these animals, the bear, um, this is a, you know, the, all the bears, whether it be polar bears, uh, grizzly bears, sun bears, all those guys are, are like dogs. They're kind of, they're a little bit like a cat, but more so like a dog, you know, when it comes. Different, there is some idiosyncrasies, but in general, a lot of the physiology is the same. So then we have our cats, which is our kitty cat there, and then our variety of animals. Um, interesting that you know they all they're all different sizes, yet they pretty much it, they, excuse me they all have the same same disease processes. They're also just like the canids and the felids are susceptible to the same diseases, viral diseases that our domestic animals get. Part of our preventive medicine program is vaccinate. I vaccinate these guys for all the cat diseases, mainly feline distemper. And um, the feline distemper is the main one. Our dogs, the canine distemper, the parvo. Why do I do that? Is I'm protecting them from the feral animals coming in. Um, they're not. I'm not protecting them from each other, but I'm protecting them from the um, the feral dog or the feral cat that may work its way into the zoo. Our raccoons all that. We also do surveillance of any feral animal that dies on zoo grounds. I do necropsies or autopsies on to help me determine the disease status of those animals and how they may affect our collection. Then we move on to the hoof stock. So we got all these guys here. So we got a horse and a cow. Those are the two, the two animals that we're working with. And again, it's really cool because it's you're looking at physiology, and the majority of that physiology is, re, is um, GI physiology. The cow is a four-chambered stomach. They're, they're four-gut fermenters. The cow is a high-gut fermenter. So um, you then connect the zebra is a horse, the taper, with are the South American animals, they're horses, giraffe is a cow, oryx is a cow, and kudu is a cow. And so that's how a rhino, which I don't have up there, that's a horse. Elephant is a horse. Um, so they're treated that way. Um, what's interesting with the cow, which is one of the things is with foregut fermenters, you're very limited on the amount of, of the type of antibiotics that you can give orally. The rumen breaks down or degrades a lot of antibiotics. So what we do is I go, well, if I can't give that to a cow, I can't give that to a giraffe. I also can't give it to a kangaroo because they're like a, they're like a cow. Um, then on the other end, a koala is like a horse. They're hindgut fermenters. So there's a lot of other disease processes um, that they can have. They can have twists. They can have various torsions, just like a horse. Um, so and then again, I don't have another picture up, but primates. OK, you have your great apes. They're humans. So I have a lot of human anatomy books, and not so much anatomy books, but physiology books, pharmacology books. I basically treat them, you know, if they have a cold, they get some, you know, Tylenol, plenty of fluids, you know, things like that. They're treated, yes, right, they're treated, yep, they're treated, they're treated like that. Yet, there are idiosyncrasies with primates as well, because besides, you also have your leaf-eating primates. Okay, you have um, Francois monkeys, which are um, uh, an Asian monkey. They're like a cow. They have chambered stomachs. They have the same problems with oral antibiotics that a cow would have. So I'm limited. A lot of times to get medicine into them, I may have to inject them. Um, howler monkeys, which are a South American leaf-eating monkey, are hindgut fermenters like horses. They have the same, so you basically look, it's really cool, it's really neat. You look at their anatomy, you look at their physiology, you try to pair it up to a particular domestic animal model and away you go. Then we get our little rodent, a little mouse, and he's, you know, the same as a capybara, which is a guinea pig that weighs about 150 pounds. <laughs> You know, but they're the same. They have those big, like it's Gundi, they have those big teeth. 
you know, porcupines, you know, and so you basically look at this little mouse and he gets treated the same way as all these exotics do, or we treat the exotics the same way as we treat our little mouse. And there's a lot of research on mouse medicine just because of um, research in lab animal medicine. We have a, a great, a great amount of knowledge in that regard that we can then look into for our domestic, for our exotics. Then with the chickens, you know, everybody, they're all, when you x-ray them, they all look like chickens. <laughs> you know, they all, you know, again, it's, it's interesting because they all do because, well, the flighted birds, because their, their ability to fly physiologically limits how big, how stretched out they can get. So when you x-ray them from a bald eagle to a, to whatever, if they fly, they look like a chicken. Um, so, but they're cool. They, they come in all different shapes and sizes. Um, a lot of the disease is the same. They may have different susceptibilities, but again, we treat, we, we treat them all the same. Or we look at, we start out with the chicken as a model, and then we diverse depending on the various physiologies because their digestive makeup is different as well because a chicken is a seed eater. A penguin is a fish eater. Um, so their, their digestive anatomy may be a bit different. Um, these cal cassowaries are seed eaters, but they eat a little bit of meat. The hornbills, they'll eat a mouse every once in a while. You know, so they're, they'll, they'll eat a little bit of fruit, uh, mice, rodents, things like that. Um, so it gives us, and it's cool. There's just all sorts of animals, different sizes. What's really neat about the penguins is they, they're tracheas. You know, and I don't know, it's only, I know you'll ask me why and I don't know, but they, their trachea bifurcates into two tracheas right at the larynx. So the minute you have your larynx, you have about, I don't know, a mill, a centimeter, three and a half, no, there's, yeah, inch, yeah, centimeter. So about, after about one centimeter, there's two tracheas that go all the way down. Whether that has to do with diving, those things, it's a very difficult to intubate one of those because you can only put the tube in about this far because then you run into that bifurcation. So what we end up doing is we do two trachea, we do two endotracheal tubes, tape them together and then have one opening. So you do a lot of modification to allow, um, to allow you. There are also these crane types which have a trachea that comes down and then right here, it does about five curls and then goes in. And why that is, I don't exactly know, but I wish I, wish I had an x-ray to show you, but it's really amazing. And again, they think it has to do with vocalization, you know, things like that. Also, they're thinking that there's some, the dead space has some respiratory um, benefit for long flights when they're migrating and things like that. Um, but it is a very challenge to scope them down the trachea to get, if let's say they swallow, they aspirate something in their lungs. You know, you, you don't have a scope that can twist enough to get in there, so you end up having to, you know, cut open the tracheal rings and go down in. So sometimes their anatomy precludes them from being treated as easily as a chicken. But we start out with those guys. Um, then there's domestic animals, which I have no true model. They're little, they're kind of mixes of everything. We got our shark, our fish. You know, he's, they're, they're unique in their own. Um, when I first started, um, they're really neat. Um, again, these are cartilaginous animals, um, as opposed to the bony with the swim bladders and all that. I remember when I started my career, when I started at the aquarium, you know, I went, the, what I did is before I started, I took a lot of the herring that we fed our seals and our penguins and I dissected. I did, I did necropsies on a feed fish so that I could determine what their anatomy was. It's quite unique. Um, your iguanas or lizard types are, they're herbivorous. So they have, they're similar in, in some ways to, to horses with their, their type of hindgut. The snakes are carnivorous. Their anatomy is majorly stretched out. And what's really neat too with them is through studies and what studies have done is we've taken a snake and divided them into four sections. 
So I know what organs are in the first section, the second, because when I got to do a liver biopsy and I got a snake that's 10 <laughs> feet long, I go, okay, where's that liver? So I basically take the, I take the snake, divide him by four, tape him, and then I just go to that section and that's where the liver is. And that's basically, you know, so you have to, through research and through people that find that out, but it's just things that you have to, to, to work on. But that all the organs are there, you just got to know where they are. Um, dolphins. Dolphins are unique. They have four-chambered stomachs. Some people felt they were relatives of ruminants um, evolutionarily. Um, they also are carnivorous as well, so they have various different anatomies and ways, the way they work. I, they have a, a, chambered, a, three, a chambered stomach. It doesn't work the same way, so they can take oral meds like, like a carnivore can. But they're unique. They are really cool for intubation. Um, they have a blowhole. Okay, so, um, so what you do is they have a thing. What happens is for your anatomy, you got your blowhole, then you got a, a little, it's like a, um, a ring, okay, a, a ring. There's what they call the gooseneck, and the, the larynx fits up into that little hole, okay? Because what happens is these blowholes are divided, okay? So you can't stick an endotracheal tube down those things. You can't, like, tube them up on the head, okay? So what happens is that gooseneck, can di they can dislocate that gooseneck. So you actually reach into their mouth, pull it out from that connection, pull it down, and then intubate them. And when you're done, you take it and pop it back up. <laughs> it's, pardon? Yep, it's so cool. And, it's, and why is that? Why did they do that? One person told me, well, they're out in the ocean, it's raining. You know, so they're always getting water in their head. <laughs> and so they can, they can, you know, do this on their own. They dislocate and they pop out that water that sits down in that cavity. And so they can get rid of that water that builds up. So if it's raining, their whole, I mean, they can't keep that blowhole closed forever. And so that I thought, again, they're difficult to anesthetize in general because, um, we, what do you call it, we spontaneously are, we hold our breath. We know when we're holding our breath. And then we unconsciously breathe. They kind of do the opposite. They have to consciously breathe, but they normally hold their breath. So when they anesthetize them, they don't like to breathe. So you end up always having to ventilate for them. So they're, they're, they're a challenge as well. Um, insects, they're cool too. Um, they, we anesthetize, we, um, I don't know where to stop, but they, I gotta, we got to move on, I'm sorry. Um, but, oh, I got, but fish are cool too. You can anesthetize them. They use a drug called MS-222 in the water, um, and it anesthetizes them. You then can take them out of the water. You pass a tube through their gills, because all that thing that they oxygenate with is their gills. So they can stay out of the water for a half hour to an hour why you do abdominal surgery or whatever you need to do on them, and then you can put them back in the water. we got to move on quick. Means of delivery and anesthesia. This is the, um, your basic way of capture and restraint, nets, gloves, hedgehog restraint, <laughs> so that you don't get poked. Then we move on to um, delivering anesthesia via dart. Um, the dart, the cool thing about a dart is basically this is a, a syringe that has a needle on it that the end is plugged. Then there's a little hole right there that, is, that a silastic sleeve passes over that hole and then plugs it. You then pressurize that dart. You can use air or use butane, and that holds the drug. Then you stick it in the pipe, you shoot it, and then what happens is when that hits the animal, the sleeve slips and the drug is injected in the animal. Hurts. It can hurt. And that's why, again, we try to get them to take most of their meds orally, but if it doesn't work, it has to be given via injection. We also anesthetize animals that same way. Then we have in the field, we have a little more intense 
needles for the thicker skinned animals. These are metal darts, um, longer needles. This actually, rather than air or, um, or um, butane, is actually an explosive charge that when it hits the animal, it drives the drug in. Um, this is a picture of our field kit. This is our accidental exposure kit. Um, one thing to know, we use a lot of the similar drugs that we use in, um, in, vet in the domestic veterinary medicine, but one drug we do use is a very powerful morphine derivative. There's two of them. There's M99 and carfentanil, which is 100,000 times the strength of morphine. So, what you're, so basically a small volume can drop an elephant, um, but also a small, very even a smaller volume can drop you. Um, stop breathing and then cardiac arrest. And that's like a spray, gets into your mucous membranes, um, you know, if you get a cut, things like that. So we have our accidental exposure kit. We all, you know, can put catheters in animals, so therefore we feel comfortable about doing it in people as well. Um, so we have catheter kits, um, endotracheal tubes, AMBU bags, all that, that if someone is to be exposed, we could initiate those things on whoever was unfortunate enough to be exposed. Luckily, we also have an ant, the, a reversal agent. That's a good thing about the, um, the opiate or the morphine derivatives. If you have a reversal agent that we give to the animals as well to wake them up. I don't know if you've seen in the wildlife shows. I always used to use Mutual of Omaha with Marlon Perkins and everybody would go, who's he? So anyway, uh, now I just say wildlife shows. Um, and yeah, now it's Steve Irwin, there you go. Yeah. So anyway, um, we have that, luckily we haven't had that happen, but we're ready for it. And of course, we have the human people on board as to what drugs we're using and what protocols we have as well, in case we were to stick our thing. I have. <laughs> luckily they're out of shape. <laughs> Um, root canal on a tiger. Um, this is our um, Siberian tiger. She weighs about 400 pounds, had a fractured tooth. Um, so we darted her. There she is sleeping. Um, we have to always be very careful about approaching. We usually use a, a broom or a stick and we kind of poke at them and run it in their ear and shake it around, make sure that she's asleep. I've been run out of a cage on occasion, so and it's not a very fun thing when all of a sudden you think they're asleep and they're not. Um, so we get them asleep, we take them, we haul them to the hospital. So here we have the fractured tooth. Here's a dental x-ray. We had a human dentist come and help us out with this. This is, you know, keeping the mouth open and also we'll hold the mouth open like that so we can intubate. Um, a lot of times when their mouth or when their mouths or when animals that big, you actually just use your arm and you stick it in with the tube and then stick it into the, into the larynx. You don't really use a scope, so you have to trust the person making sure the mouth stays open while you're doing that. And then there he is with the endotracheal tube. That's again what's interesting is the variety of things. People ask me what's the most difficult animal to work on and it's basically the real, real big ones and the real, real small ones. And that's because you don't have the equipment for diagnostics. You know, you don't have the ability to do a chest x-ray on an elephant. You know, uh, a little hummingbird you can't hardly see. So therefore, that makes it a real challenge in that regard. Um, so anyway, the endotracheal tubes, I, again, you, you basically will um, improvise on things. I've used um, small 20-gauge catheters as endotracheal tubes. Um, these tubes right here are about this big, I have tubes that are about this big around for the rhinos and elephants. So you have a wide range of, of um, instruments to be able to get them asleep. This is the, the canal prep, drilling, and the, the final product afterwards. That way, okay. Then we move on to form bodies in a harbor seal. Um, it's a harbor seal that um, basically over time started to drop in his food consumption, um, just was, was hungry but just didn't want to eat that much. Turned out that we x-rayed him. This is a portable x-ray machine, um, a very common 
instrument used in equine medicine works really well. Um, here he is being intubated. We x-rayed him and his whole stomach is full of rocks, plus a battery and some coins. Um, what happened is this guy, um, we have a little train that rides around called a little puffer and the track has rocks that's ballast and people would take those rocks and throw them at the seals or and so those rocks would be in the water and this animal had a, a propensity to eat rocks. He just wasn't sure why but he did and so he filled up with so much rocks that um, he couldn't eat any more fish. Well, so this is what we did. Um, we did endoscopy, um, scope, those are rocks there just to look at the stomach, see what damage, if anything. Then I did if any of you were, when you were kids or whatever, ate something you shouldn't have and you were get your stomach flushed. Well, that's what I did here. This is a <laughs> big hose. This is the inflow tube under here and the outflow trying to get, is about so big, you know, trying to flush to get the, to get the rocks out, that didn't work, so we moved into the next thing, i.e. surgical prep. So we basically did surgery. You know, isolated the stomach, cut it open, pulled all that stuff out. And then here he is sutured up. Um, we, it was a bit of a challenge for him because this is an aquatic animal. He's got an incision on his belly. So we had to try to keep him as dry as possible um, yet keep him wet, so it was a bit of a challenge, but he stayed out, had to stay out of the water for about, oh, seven, eight days. Um, sometimes we'll use super glue, various uh, um, adhesives to try to seal those wounds so that they can get in the water sooner. Here's treatment of an elephant. Okay, this elephant had a unique problem. Um, name was Callie. She had tuberculosis, um, human tuberculosis. Um, how did that occur? Um, it's a zoonotic, you think of tuberculosis as a zoonotic disease <coughs> transmitted from animals to humans, you know, like in the, the bovine TB, but in this case, they're thinking in the elephants that the wild cots were actually transmitted from humans to, to the elephants. The mahouts that would take care of these animals um, when they were little, um, there's a high incidence of tuberculosis in, in Asia and there's a good chance that the animal had picked it up from there. So we tried to give, we treated that animal once it was diagnosed. Now again, how do you um, diagnose it? Um, so like with humans, they do sputums, you know, cough up something in a cup. Well, what we did is what we call trunk washes. What I would do is I would take the end of his trunk, her trunk, shoot up some saline, and tell her to forcefully exhale. And then I would put a bag on the end of that and she would blow the, all those contents into, we used actually, it was a um, um, cotton candy bags. <laughs> we had plenty of them. And that has allowed us to isolate the organism so then therefore we can, for the diagnosis and then start the treatment. Beginning of the treatment was done with oral medications. And as you probably could understand that, it takes a lot of medicine to treat a 10,000 pound animal. So therefore, we put it in ice cream, we put it in beer, we tried um, everything. Chocolate was another one that we tried, um, but the animal could taste the drug. The, also, the animal was ill from the medication, so it would go off its feed, therefore the mode of delivery wouldn't work. So our next route was to then give the medicine rectally. So what we did is we developed a suppository, which I called rectocillin, um, and that we then gave to that animal. So here we are, here I am with my glove, rectal, you basically have to take all the feces out and then um, do the rectal palpation and insert the suppository. Did that every day for a year and a half. Well every day for a year and then every three days for a half. I believe me, I taught as many people as possible on how to do that. <laughs> Yet what's interesting is that I'm left-handed and she got so used to that that everyone had to do it left-handed. So she liked that better than taking the pills? Well, she, at that point, she would take it and she would retain it. 
and she would not, and what was interesting though, is she didn't realize it was given rectally because if you, because the drug when, I don't know if any of you have taken those drugs, but they can kind of make you sick to your stomach. Yeah. And um, so what was, yeah, so what was interesting is when you gave the drug rectally, she sensed that she wasn't feeling well and she would start picking through her food because she kept thinking it was coming. So she'd step on her squashes or step on her, on her um, watermelons and look and stuff. So she, so we basically had to treat her and were successful. These are the routes we tried. This was the first way. This is the drug, a big, huge plunger that we made. So we take this, we run it up into a rectum, and it's a big plunger, and we just plunge the drug in. Yeah, she's a good elephant. How long, how long is the Longer than I can reach. Um, I, I don't have the number of feet, but there's, but basically this wouldn't even touch how far you need can go. Um, so this was given as a liquid. We just took it as a liquid and gave it. Um, that really didn't work. It was too irritating. She would expel it quickly, and we didn't have the retention time for the, um, for the drug to take effect. So then we went to suppositories. We basically formed a cocoa butter shell that would melt, and we put the drug in there. That, the, the, the melt rate didn't work too well, meaning she would expel it before it melted enough. So then we made suppositories where the drug was mixed in with the, the cocoa butter. So then this became the route. And we went through, probably by the time we got to where we get drug levels, we went through about 20 different formulations. It took a long time to finally get through the help of a human pharmacist that helped us um, allow this to happen. It was. It was close to... $90,000 to do all that, to treat that animal. Um, but we learned a lot. Okay, yep, and that, right, and that one, one quick last thing, and then this is the last one, and okay. sorry, but um, is our bald eagle program. Um, this is a, just a, one of the neat things about zoo medicine is our conservation efforts. Um, we deal with the bald eagle. The bald eagle is in, was an endangered species on Catalina Island. They were exposed to DDT in the water. They were scavengers. Their eggs were soft shelled and they basically um, weren't hatching and became endangered. We got part of that program. They would, the, the biologists would go up and collect those eggs, those soft shelled eggs, and then put dummy eggs in there. They would fly the eggs to us we would then incubate them under controlled circumstances, get them to rate, get a chick out of it. When the chick's about two to three days old, they take that chick back to the island, pull the dummy egg out, set it in there, and mom goes, oh, I got a baby. <laughs> and so we did that. We've been doing that program for, it's been 10 years. We've raised 100 chicks. Um, and we have also have our own breeding population at the zoo that we, we supplement those nests as well, the same way. Um, if one of their eggs is broken, dummy egg. And so we now, at this point, as of two years ago, it went from endangered to threatened, and we're out of business, but we did a good thing. Mm -hmm. And that's <laughs> it. <laughs>